Here's another problem where I'm giving you one side and one angle. This side is 7 and this angle is 20 degrees. Uh, of course, you actually know this angle too because it's a right triangle. Uh, but I've given you one angle in addition to the right angle. That's what I mean when I say one side and one angle. One angle in addition to the right angle, which we take for granted when we have a right triangle. Try to figure out everything else about this triangle. Try to figure out all the other angles and all the other sides. Please pause the video and give that a shot. If these problems are difficult for you, try to use the same exact notation that I used on the previous problem. I recommended that if you're finding these problems difficult or if you find that you make careless mistakes, you should try to use the same notation that I'm demonstrating on the board. For example, you can start by putting in asterisks to remind yourself of the information that you're going to be using. Remember the convention is to try to figure out as much as we can using the original given information, not using the new information we're going to figure out as we go. So I'll put in the asterisks to help us with that. Well, the easiest thing to do is to start by finding this angle. We know that these two angles of the right triangle have to add up to 90. So this angle must be 90 minus 20, which is 70. But I'm not going to put an asterisk over here because the convention is that you try to figure things out using the angle you were originally given. There's no reason why you have to do that mathematically, but that's what people conventionally do. So we're going to keep trying to figure stuff out using the 20. We're not going to use the 70 to figure more stuff out because that's just, what not, that's just not what is usually done. Okay. Um, now notice that I also have this asterisk on the 7, indicating that obviously I'm going to try to use the 7 to figure stuff out. Uh, well, let's label the sides here. The 7 represents the hypotenuse. This horizontal side is the adjacent side, and the vertical side is opposite, because it's opposite to the asterisk. This is where the asterisk comes in very handy, uh, because it tells us which side is adjacent to the asterisk and which side is opposite to the asterisk. If we'd been focusing on the 70, then the adjacent and the opposite sides would be different. All right, now, which trigonometric function is not going to be useful here? Well, remember that we want to use trigonometric functions that involve the hypotenuse, because that's something we know something about. We have to use things that involve the hypotenuse. Well, that would be sine and cosine. It would be useless to try to use the tangent, because the tangent won't give us a chance to use this number 7. We're going to have to try to use the number 7 to figure stuff out. Um, so we have to use trigonometric functions that involve the cosine. The tangent's not going to cut it for us. Um, because that does not involve the hypotenuse. So we're going to use the sine of 20 and the cosine of 20. Let's start with the cosine of 20. Let's write the general formula. Cut cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And now we'll plug in. What's the adjacent side? We don't know. What's the hypotenuse? Well, the hypotenuse has a length of 7. That was the whole reason that we used the, co the cosine and not the tangent. Because with the cosine, we could plug a number in for the hypotenuse. But the tangent doesn't involve the hypotenuse. And now we need to get rid of this fraction by cross-multiplying. First of all, give yourself a fraction on both sides by putting the left-hand side over 1. Uh, and now we can multiply diagonally. Well, 1 times the adjacent side is just the adjacent side. Oh, I'll just write that out one more time. 1 times the adjacent side. And we have 7 times the cosine of 20. These are the two expressions we get when we multiply diagonally. 1 times the adjacent side is just the same as the length of the adjacent side. And we can use our calculator to find 7 times the cosine of 20. You can do that in one step. You don't have to find the cosine first and then multiply. 7 times the cosine of 20 is 6.6. .6. adjacent side has a length of 6.6. .6. Every time you figure something out, you should put it in your sketch. So the adjacent side has a length of 6.6. .6. Alright, now we want to figure out the opposite side. And again, the convention is that we should try to figure out the opposite side um, just using the original information about the hypotenuse and the original information about the angle. Um, well, if we, want to find, um, if we want to work with the opposite side and the hypotenuse, that would involve the sine. 
The sine involves the opposite side and the hypotenuse. So let's find the sine of 20. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. What do I plug in for the opposite sign? Well, I don't know the opposite sign. And what do I plug in for the hypotenuse? 7. Now we can use cross multiplication. Multiplying diagonally. 1 times the opposite side is 1 diagonal multiplication. And 7 times the sine of 20 is the other multiplication. 1 times the opposite side is just the length of the opposite side. And then we can use our calculator to find 7 times the sine of 20, which is 2.4. Uh, the length of the opposite side is 2.4. Let's build that into our sketch. And now we figured everything out about this triangle. Again, there's other ways we could have figured out the same information. Um, there's really a bunch of ways we could have figured out this 2.4. Um, we used the sine to figure out the 2.4. It's also possible to figure out the 2.4 using the Pythagorean theorem, which we haven't covered yet, but you might have heard of. Or we could even use the tangent to find this 2.4. However, the way it's conventionally done is the way that I've done it on the board. The only way that we can figure out the opposite side just using the original given information um, is to use the sine. So that's the way we're going to be focusing on. But there are other ways that you could figure out um, that 2.4. If this problem gave you any difficulty, then before you move on to the next problem, you should just redo this problem. Keep redoing the problem until it's boringly easy, and then you can move on to the next problem. Uh, in fact, right now we're going to be doing a whole bunch of problems, a whole bunch of examples. And my recommendation is, after each problem, if you miss any of the problems or if any of them give you difficulty, don't move on from that point until you've redone that problem until it doesn't give you difficulty anymore. There's no point moving on to newer and maybe harder problems if you haven't really mastered the older and maybe easier problems.